All right, moving on to this week to the actual lecture part. Um, what we've got going on is um, this is the end of the mort. And some of you are going like, yay, the end of the mort, <laughs> because you may have found this book incredibly boring. You may have found parts of it interesting, but it may not have been your favorite book. I really enjoyed the mort. I didn't enjoy all of the mort when I went through it. Um, and some of you may be like, oh, well, the teacher just must be in love with the, the entire story because she's teaching it and she knows all the stuff about it. But that's not entirely true. I'm as human as the next person. There are parts of the mort I like better than the others. And I think I've told you guys, I actually really like the Tristram Isode story. The song Grawl um, is occasion. I don't know, it's not my favorite section. I, there are parts of it that are really interesting to me because it's kind of the allegorical aspects of it. Um, but for some reason, one of my favorite parts is this last part. There's something so poignant about Arthur. And this is one of the few places, because Gawain is just kind of this up and down character throughout the world. And Lancelot is himself. But he's a very central character throughout. He's not one of those characters that gets picked up and dropped, picked up and dropped, picked up and dropped. He and Lancelot and Arthur, they get picked up and they just, they stay up through the whole thing. We're, we're constantly running into them. And um, so we've had a lot of character development of Gawain. And so this, this kind of feud type relationship that arises between Lancelot and Gawain because of the death of Gawain's brothers, of course accidental death of Gawain's brothers by Lancelot, um, is just kind of riveting. And, um, you know, he gets very, very intense. He's a very angry sort of individual about all this. And, and I mean, you know, what would you expect? What would you do in that situation? Um, especially at that time period. Um, Especially in a book that constantly is praising violence as the answer to these sorts of problems. Now, it's supposed to be kind of ordered violence in the sense that, um, you know, we're going to meet at the end of the list and I'm going to schedule a day to meet you and that sort of thing. But nonetheless, uh, violence as a way to cure these sorts of ills is, is you know, positively viewed throughout the mort. And, um, and so this is, we have action throughout the mort. I mean, there's constant action, everyone's always getting knocked off their horses and saddles are bursting and, you know, and, and they're beating each other and they're bleeding so much they can't believe they can still go on. All that stuff is happening constantly. This is a little different tone. It's like it's like we've reached a place there's some more psychological elements going on here, maybe because of the death of Ga um, Gareth and Gaharis and um, it, it's like it's reached this different level psychologically. So it's not just knights running at each other because it's a tournament and they want to win. Um, it's it's not just even it's not even almost just vengeance because there's certainly other places where vengeance comes out, uh, the poisoned apple and that sort of thing. There are other places in the mort where vengeance plays an important role, King Mark. But this, you know, this is like two of the most renowned knights. Um, whether or not Gawain may always be the best you know, best knight in the sense that he's moral um, isn't so much the case or isn't as much important as the fact that he's one of the most visible knights. And so we have what we know is the best knight in the world against one of the most visible knights and one of those that's closest related to Arthur because he's um, a nephew out of Arthur's sister. Um, and of course Mordred is actually Arthur's son as we know. And um, so all this stuff is just building to a head and, uh, and then, of course, we have this interesting turn with the way Mordred views uh, Guinevere. Because Guinevere is really interesting in this last part as well. Not only because she locks herself up, because in other earlier versions, as you, if you guys can remember, Guinevere actually consents to be with Mordred. I mean, like, there's some positiveness then and tries to escape Arthur by going to a nunnery or something like that. And in other instances, she's captured as she is here and kind of forced into a situation where she might have to marry Mordred. In some instances, she does marry Mordred. Um, and so we've seen these different ways that Guinevere and Mordred interact. And that's not exactly the case here. Guinevere's clearly in love with Lancelot still. Um, she doesn't want to marry Mordred, you know, when Arthur leaves to go take care of all this stuff. And, um, and so, you know, but then she locks herself away, um, during, during this whole battle, and, um, and, and we see kind of a, a determinant, determination in Guinevere, um, a strength in her character we don't always see. Guinevere is very changeable throughout the mort, 
Um, and some people view that positively and some people view it ne view her negatively for those reasons. Actually, female readers tend to view her positively and male readers tend to view her negatively. You may, whether you're female or male, view her your own way because everyone does come out with different interpretations. Those are just general uh, patterns um, based on readership. Um, but this is just, there's so much going on here in just 45 pages or so, you know, here's everything really and truly coming to a head. We've, we've constantly got this hints about Lancelot and Guinevere throughout, and here, here you know, it, it finally hits, hits the fan, so to speak. Um, and then, you know, we've got the battle between all of the knights. The round table knights is really, you know, they've all split. They're battling it out. Um, we have the, the business with Mordred. We have the actual death of Arthur, finally. Um, Mordred and he kill each other, basically. He, of course, he tells Bedivere to take the sword. So we kind of have this little mini drama with making sure Bedivere actually takes the sword and returns it to the Lady of the Lake. Um, Excalibur, that is. Um... We have the, you know, here lies Arthur, the once and future king, um, sort of this hint that there might, he might live on as some other versions of the romance suggest he may, that he may come again, almost like Christ. Um, but it, the more it seems to suggest that he really dies, in a way more so um, than some of the other texts. Um, I mean, because it says after Arthur's death there, you know, when Guinevere goes off to the nunnery and all that sort of thing. And, of course, that little bit at the end with Lancelot and Guinevere, when we go past the death of Arthur and we see kind of the final confrontation between these two characters who have caused this, um, this upheaval, uh, that was one of the most moving moments as I read the entire story, I think when Guinevere said, actually refuses Lancelot, because I think there's almost this expectation that Guinevere and Lancelot will get together and live together for the end of their days, because now they have that ability, um, and Lancelot has enough kind of earthly power to manage that, but they don't, and they go and they live these spiritual lives, kind of like has been hinted at in the song girl section, and you almost wonder if they live the spiritual lives as much for religious reasons, though that's definitely there, as they do because they've torn up this, like, most perfect earthly kingdom. Um, or at least the best one that would be on earth, even flawed as it was. And that they feel so much shame at that, that their, their shame is as earthly as it is spiritual. And, um... And so this is just a really rich section here at the end. It's, Mal, it's kind of like Mallory's been riding his way up to this level of, of character development and that sort of thing. Of course, the events are not, you know, he doesn't make them up, but there are ways of he, that he interprets them that are original to him that truly make the story unique. And, um, oh, I forgot to, sorry. Um, anyway, so this is what, um, what we've had going on, and, um, it's, it's just a really cool story, and then I've given you guys a couple of articles this week to read, or, well, it's, it's, it's I've given you guys four articles this week to read because we have few, a little bit less reading in the book, and these are kind of articles that I like to kind of close with because they cover ideas related to the way the, the story ends, um, like one about Guinevere, another one about tombs and, and the roles they play, um, another about boars, um, because I think boars is a really central character in this last part of, of the story and his relationship with Lancelot. And um, so um, these, these are things that I would like to have you read. I have posted the readings for next week as well. There's I've posted a few of the... Um, some criticism, like I do, the, the secondary source criticism. I'm not going to have you read all of that yet. Um, I will post which ones are going to be on the quiz and which ones aren't. All of the primary text sources, that means anything from uh, Tennyson, Twain, or Steinbeck, I do want you to read. Um, one of those is fairly short. It's just a few pages. Another one is longer, 40, 40 pages or so, I think. Um, but it's none of it is above and above anything that what we've been doing um so that will be kind of next week again outlines due this friday 
uh, quiz due this Friday next week. Papers. That's when the papers are due. And you guys did a pretty good job, a decent job on your legend comparisons. Again, your legend comparisons are kind of a, a chance for me to tell you kind of writing style wise and like citation style and that sort of thing. Give me you give you a heads up on what I expected there without me having to like totally kill kill it, you know, without it being like this huge impact. It's kind of a, a way for me to give you guys a heads up of how I grade essays. Um, because like I said, I'm I'm difficult. I'm I'm a tough grader of essays. Um, you know, I expect a lot. And so I, I just expect you to know that now. Work hard on this essay. Don't put it off to the last minute. Um, I expect it to be good. And uh, so just to let you know that, you know, you're getting getting it from, front, right, straight from me. I'm tough. So, um, in fact, the essays tend to be the toughest grading I do. I'm easier on the final. I'm easier on the midterm. I certainly give you all of the study guide stuff with the quizzes and stuff. It's easier to study for the final. I know that you guys usually are writing the final more under duress than you are the paper that you haven't worked on it for a few weeks. Um, and so I tend to grade them slightly easier. But I'm tough on this paper. This paper to me should be a very polished piece. Um, so just know that. Know that I have high expectations for it. So anyway, if you guys have any questions, again, always feel free to email me. That's what I'm there for. And uh, we'll see you next week.